Mental illness is a condition that affects a person's thinking, feelings, or mood. And these conditions can affect someone's ability to live their life and interact with other people. National Alliance on Mental Illness says that one in five people experience a mental health situation at least once a week. And they also state that one in 17 live with a permanent mental condition. So mental health is the subject of this Focus Roundtable. Thanks for joining me, I'm Wes Talon. At the Focus Roundtable today are Kathy Brown Bragg, licensed clinical social worker and owner of the Family Horizon Associates. Cheryl Francis, licensed professional counselor and owner of the Heart Matters Wellness Services Full Service Counseling Agency. And Martin Altman, licensed professional counselor at the Life Development Center. Thank you all for coming in. I appreciate this very much. To begin our understanding, because as we were doing research and as we've met on this, there's a, just a wide ranging topics on this. Let's define mental illness. Cheryl, can you do that? Of course, just like you said earlier on, mental illness is something that affects someone's mood, their emotional state, and their thought process. I like to term it as uh, something that affects your, the way you live, the way you love, the way you learn, the way you laugh, and of course, the way you work. Now, mental illness does not discriminate, right? It goes to every zip code, every color, every race. And uh, there are different types of mental illness. Uh, we're going to talk about that later on. But one of the things I wanted to bring out, people use different words to describe mental illness. Sometimes they say, you know, you're psycho, or maybe you're burnt out, or maybe you have a nervous breakdown. But like the psycho or the nuts or something like that, that's something that's not helpful because people tend to stay away from getting help when we're talking about mental illness. And so we're, you know, we're talking about, um, as we use the term in the South, an awful lot about crazy people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. you know, this is not particularly people who are uh, eccentric. And believe you me, we've got eccentric people down here in the South. I'm one of them. But, uh, you know, there's the, the, <laughs> there's the standard line, um, uh, the, the Southern adage that, uh, you know, you talk about, we don't, say whether we have crazy people in our family we just ask which side they're on <laughs> and that we don't keep them in the back room you know we put them out on the front porch right. and sit in the rocking chair where they can wave to everybody going by that's eccentricities right and, and things like that yeah. so but we're talking about a, a serious subject on on mental health so that there's many different types of there right. um help me with with what we're actually talking about yeah um so how we usually hear these things described are uh, terms like anxiety, uh, depression, um, trauma-related stuff. Uh, so someone who went through a, uh, a rough patch uh, or a rough event and uh, came back very different. Uh, you, you may hear about even more severe things, uh, possibly like a, a schizophrenia, uh, like a bipolar uh, diagnosis, something like that. All of these are, are just big labels that we put on a, a set of symptoms, uh, a set of symptoms that all seem to go together and, and it looks like something that we've seen in someone else and so we, we have the ability, if we need to, and only if we need to, to put that kind of diagnosis uh, to, to kind of explain what's going on what's with that person. So there's all kinds of different things, depression, anxiety, trauma, um, PTSD. PTSD would be the trauma. When I say trauma, I, I think kind of mean PTSD. I want to include like ADHD. Yeah, ADHD. Very, very common. Yeah. You very hear common. people say that, they kind of drop it very lightly, not realizing that it is um, something that is manageable, 
with coping skills and just being able to understand exactly what it is and how to help the person be able to balance it. So you see, typically, uh, you hear a lot of times people say, oh, my child's ADHD, and you know, kind of lump them in, but it really does make a difference in terms of whether they're AD or ADHD. Okay, those are explain those. We're using letters that right. our mm -hmm. audience well, may not know. Yeah. So well, tell I mean, me what AD um, and ADHD are. Uh, well, um, let's see, AD would be attention deficit which means you would have a difficult time focusing, being able to kind of manage what you're doing to stay on task. Okay. ADHD is really the same attention deficit, but also with hyperactivity. So that's when you see people say, oh, the kids won't sit down, or I can't oh, focus, fidgeting, I'm fidgeting, yeah, no, no. I'm doing all these things at one time, and I really can't focus, I can't remember what I'm doing. So it really is something that all of us, uh, because we're all trying to multitask, right are also uh, kind of um, susceptible to, but it really does mean that, again, we have to look at what the symptoms and how it impacts on, as Cheryl said, your life, how you're working, how you're able to function with your peers, um, are you able to just be able to be happy and healthy? And so that's the difference between saying, oh, I can multitask, and then, or if I am diagnosed with attention deficit or uh, attention hyperactivity. Or yeah. if, if this problem is is creating havoc, right. you know, because mm -hmm. like you said, we all have some type of symptoms, but if yeah. it's not affecting the way we're functioning, then we wouldn't necessarily say it is a mental illness or right. mm -hmm. that's ADHD. Okay, mm -hmm. so you said a couple of minutes ago, and, you know, we kind of laughed about, you know, crazy mm -hmm. and the, the front porch mm -hmm. and stuff like that, but, you know, that's, that's it. It does, there is a stigma. There is. There is a stigma yeah. to it. So, yeah. and if you have a, a problem, there is a, a stigma mm -hmm. on that. So, how is it that we get rid of this stigma so that we can get to the root of the problem? And about well, I think just the fact that we're sitting here talking. Yes. Those are, the to me, the simplest way to kind of um, eliminate the stigma because I think we have to bring it to the forefront. We really have to be comfortable talking about it mm -hmm. and normalizing it and not really feeling as if it has to be something hit in the dark or you know we're gonna whisper about it and we're not gonna seek help. We really have to continue to talk about it just like we would talk about diabetes, hypertension, obesity, um, uh, eczema, anything that we typically have prescriptions for, mm -hmm. we go to the doctors for, right. we manage. That's the way mental health has to be viewed. And I think it's, if we move towards that um, the thinking and have that in the center of our thoughts, I think much, many more people will be able to get the help that they need. Yeah, and so many of us would never have any kind of problem um, going to a cardiologist right. if we had a heart problem right. or a right. pulmonologist if mm -hmm. we had a, a, a lung problem mm -hmm. but when it comes to changing the way that that we think uh, that we feel mm -hmm. every day that we interact with others we don't want to go to someone who practices mental health counseling mm -hmm. um, because we often don't really look at that part of ourselves our, our actual brain we don't look at that as if it were the organ that it is mm -hmm. right. um, it's right. a part of the body it has its own chemistry Absolutely. and it's affected by the rest of our, our body's chemistry and so we have to consider it as an organ and we have to treat it uh, through things like psychiatry or counseling mm -hmm. we have to seek help for the organ of the brain just as we would seek help for the organ of the lungs or the organ of the heart or right. whatever. Right. I so. like that. Mm -hmm. And the, we were talking earlier, it's all about education, mm -hmm. right? Absolutely. If I know, in, when we first started talking about HIV, you know, people were afraid that if I touch you, I might get it mm -hmm. because they weren't educated, right? And so having something like this, doing something like a mental health first aid where people are taught what to look for, what not to be afraid of, because sometimes we can be afraid of people who are experiencing symptoms of mental illness. So if we're educating the public, we can eradicate um, the stigma. If we can get rid of the myths about mental illness, like the crazies, language, I, you know, I talk about that all the time. We have to use people first. I am Cheryl, I am not bipolar. Right? Exactly. And yes. you would not go and say, hey, good to meet you, Wes, I'm diabetes. No, I'm Cheryl. So people first language, 
you know, Cheryl with symptoms of bipolar. Yes. You know, mm -hmm. so we have to be careful how we talk about mental illness because then if you're calling me bipolar and Marty is supposed to help me, I don't want Marty to know that I have a mental illness, right? But if I say, you know, I am a person with this, then I might be more open to go to Marty and say, Marty, you know what? I'm experiencing something. Can you help me? So yeah, I'm a person first who also has signs first. of right. this. Yeah. I've never thought of it in those terms that the, um, the brain being an organ. I, I like how you place that and then what you were saying, it makes sense mm -hmm. um, that I am Wes and I have whatever. Mm -hmm. I have a heart problem. Yeah. I have a broken leg. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I have a um, hypertension. Mm -hmm. I have this. It doesn't define me exactly, exactly. on that. So mm -hmm. right. that's mm -hmm. that's really in, important on that. The mm, that um, I like that. That uh, that's a whole new orientation on this. Now you said something about diagnosis and in my research for this round table I found that half of mental health conditions exist by the age of 14 mm -hmm. and that 75 percent of mental health conditions develop by age 24. Mm -hmm. That's scary. You're talking about kids in schools. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're talking about parents Mm -hmm. who may not have had an experience with mental illness. Right. Mm -hmm. And let's face it, it doesn't pop out of your skin like measles or mumps right. or right. Exactly. chicken pox. Right. You right. can't, mm -hmm. you know, right. measles and mumps and chicken Oh my gosh, my child is sick. Mm -hmm. Let's get him to the doctor. Mm -hmm. let's, let's do these things. Right. And I mean, how can a parent in particular uh, realize that their child needs professional assistance. Yeah, so I work with children, I work with families, and I work with young men. Um, and so one of those areas being children, um, most of my professional background and most of my training is, is in children's therapy and helping children and their families manage symptoms exactly what you're talking about. So the, the things that we start to look for in determining whether or not a child is being affected are similar to those that we look for in an adult, but they're a little bit different. Um, we almost always start with sleeping. How are they sleeping? How are, are they making it through the night? Are they waking up multiple times through the night? Do they seem to be able to descend down into solid, stable, good sleep? Or is that being interrupted? Because if the child is tired, then they're not, they're not gonna be able to do well in school. They're not gonna be able to make friends well. They're not gonna be able to maintain life at the level that they could if, if they were sleeping. Right. Um, you'll also find, just as an aside, you'll also find that most psychiatrists, regardless of the age, will start with the question, how are you sleeping? sleeping. Yeah, absolutely. Because mm -hmm. that's one of the first things that, we'll, that they'll need to help stabilize uh, to get uh, life to happening at a, a, a normal and, and healthy level again. Mm -hmm. So after sleeping, uh, we also look at our, how are they eating? Are they, um, are they eating in a, in a healthy way? Are they able to eat enough to, to meet their needs? Are they eating a lot too much? Are they you know, overeating, undereating? Are they um, taking care of their physical body in a way that will enable their brain to function at its highest level? Um, beyond that, we're looking at things like, well, in school, how are their grades? Yeah. Are they getting along with their peers? Are they making friends? Do they seem to be socially isolated? Are they able to follow rules at school? Or are their behaviors um, such that they're getting written up a lot? Or they're getting ISS? Are, they're, mm -hmm. you know, are they avoiding school? Are, mm -hmm. they, are they skipping class mm -hmm. a lot um, for older kids? But what are, what are the things that, that we're seeing in school that could indicate, yeah, he, this person may, he or she may need a little bit of extra help. Um, do they talk a lot about things like uh, hard events or traumatic events that they went through? Mm -hmm. Do they, does every, um, every comment during a quiet moment, does that kind of go back to that time that so-and-so died? or that time that this happened or that happened or we moved or I changed schools? Um, do they often go back to a time like that? Do, do they often um, 
comment to the parent at times like that uh, that would indicate that they're kind of in their thinking stuck right there um, and needing to process that a little bit more with a professional. Marty, I'm going to say something yeah. on that too because sometimes it's also the opposite. Oh, mm -hmm. yes, right. thank you. It's also the opposite. Right. So yeah. it's, it's very important that we pay attention to the whole spectrum because if they're very expressive, yes. right, then we're hearing what's happening and so we can intervene. But then there are those kids who really just are withdrawn mm -hmm. or who keeps whatever yeah. it is, you know, to themselves. And that's also a challenge that um, we have, we, we're exposed to and we have to pay attention to in order to support them. But I didn't mean to yeah, yeah, they're, they're to fine. add that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they like can the isolate side. from from their family, they can isolate from their peers, they can mm -hmm. isolate from their schools, they can cut themselves off from all the resources right. that could help them mm -hmm. just by trying to protect them and, and trying to avoid um, the shame or the stigma. Right. Just like we're talking, there's right. still a stigma out mm -hmm. there for, right. for kids. Shame, that's the first time we've used this term on mm -hmm. here mm -hmm. and I hadn't thought about it but your parents may feel that this activity of, of their kids is shameful right yeah and unfortunately a lot of parents feel that way because they don't really know what to do and they don't often know where to go to get help and it's not as if um, your child is getting you know an honor on the honor roll and being able to be um, you know kind of celebrated um, you're getting those calls from school, you're getting those write-ups, you're getting those, you know, uh, not being invited to parties and, mm -hmm. you know, being kind of the isolated. The opposite just, from the honor roll. Absolutely, just not really being celebrated. And so for parents, they are constantly um, challenged with what do I do, who do I talk to. That's why, again, it's so important to kind of normalize this because when your child has a fever, you don't second guess it. You right. you know you may do the Tylenol or whatever, but you're going to take them to the doctor. You're going to take them to you're the gonna doctor. You're going to take them. You're going to take yeah. them. Okay. So if your experience, if if your child, for example, is experiencing some of the things that we talked about, mm -hmm. and this is not an exhaustive list, right. but it, it's giving our listeners, our viewers, some idea of what to look for if mm -hmm. your child has behavior that's just not particularly in the norm, okay? So what do they do? Before we go back there, I want to kind of add something else. When we're trying to look at what might be the challenge, and that's how I define it, mm -hmm. instead of calling it a disorder or a problem, mm -hmm. right? We have to tweak, even as parents, we can tweak out what's really going on. Mm -hmm. And I think especially in teens, I work with teens, Yeah the behaviors are so easily misunderstood yeah. because we say, oh, it's, they're just teenagers, or oh, they're PMSing, or oh, you know, and we misunderstand that a child who is very irritable might just be depressed, a child who is withdrawn might just be depressed, a child who loves band and no longer wants to do band might just be depressed. And I think it's important that we kind of clear out that misunderstanding yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I haven't met too okay. many teenagers out there who didn't need <laughs> or didn't wouldn't benefit from talking right. to talking a therapist it yes. because it's such a transitional time. Yes. Yes. Here yes. I am with a brand new body. Mm -hmm. Here I am with a developing mind that's smarter than I've ever been. I've got mm -hmm. more strength. I've got more knowledge. I've got more power. Now, how do I use it? Mm -hmm. yes. You know, and that's then, yeah. the, I'm on the verge. Right. Yeah. And, and then think, all of those hormones. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah the and, hormonal shift. Right. Yeah. And I think also the difference is between the genders. Yes. Because uh, mental health issues, whether it's anxiety or depression, whatever, looks totally different for girls versus boys. Right. Yeah. And so, you know, as Cheryl mentioned, you know, you may have that person who is very irritable, um, you know, very um, isolated. Uh, the, that may be some symptoms that, you know, anger, the aggression, that may be more of what you see in a male child versus a female child. You know, you may see the, the females more, you know, easily labeled as, oh, well, you know, PMS and hormones. Yeah. But those same things happen to boys in terms of them trying to figure out who they are and the differences and changes in their bodies. Okay. For so boys, are for yeah. boys, everything looks like anger. You yes. know, the yeah. only yes. acceptable right. Right. Um, emotion that we're taught or socialized to that's okay to to express is anger. Mm -hmm. So if we're sad, we look angry. angry right. You know, mm -hmm. if we're scared, we look angry. Right. Um, mm -hmm. If we're angry, we look 
More and than we than we <laughs> Especially as teenage boys. Yes. yes. Okay. <laughs> okay, so let's go back to the, the, yeah. to the question. How do you take that first step, whether you have a, an adolescent or a teenager, how does a parent take that first step and what is that first step? I think the first step is really having a conversation with the child yeah. and not being accusatory and right. not trying to diagnose, but really listening, yeah. listening yeah. and observing. And because I feel like the parents are the experts on their children. They know them, they know them best, mm -hmm. but it really is about being observant and listening. And then once you, even if you're not sure, right. to then have conversations with other people, other people who have children the same ages to kind of say, oh, what are you seeing? Are, are this, these are things that I'm seeing, you know, and not being afraid to hold back. You know, no, we don't know everything as parents. No, we're so not manual. perfect, mm -hmm. but nobody, one, no one has all the answers. And that's why we have to seek out professionals. So once we kind of get a baseline in terms of kind of observing, as Martin said, the sleeping, the eating, the socialization or the lack of, then we have to say, okay, this is something that I really don't understand, but I know in my gut, because you have to go with your senses, you know, because you're not an expert, but go with your gut and say, mm, something's not quite right. Yeah. I need to go and talk to someone. And whether it be a pediatrician or maybe right. it even be your doctor, mm -hmm. and you talk to your doctor, and this is what I'm seeing, and that doctor could then refer based to someone that. else based on what you're saying. But you really have to listen and be observant. And a good, a good way to approach a teen especially is to say, I'm concerned about you. Right. Right? Because we know riding in the car with the kids in the back how was school today good what you doing <laughs> today word nothing <laughs> you know so who's going to open up food. Yes. <laughs> it wasn't good <laughs> was it good yeah. no. yes. so it's important i'm concerned about you what you're concerned about me yeah and that might just open the door mm -hmm. for them mm -hmm. to begin talking yeah, yeah. And, and doing that i like the idea uh, that you suggested going to your family doctor and letting your family doctor because of the network yes, and all absolutely. that he or she may have mm -hmm. or that she and he or she has right. Right. being mm -hmm. able to refer you to the parent to uh, get a professional help absolutely uh, because as we were talking about y'all do even though you as all three of you work in this field mm -hmm. each of you has uh, some specialty Right. Mm -hmm. And that, and so we need to get the the child with these uh, symptoms mm -hmm. to the correct person, mm -hmm. to yes. the appropriate mm -hmm. thing right. like this. Right. Um, and let me just add, and and that I think is a, a good point in terms of that perfect fit. And I often tell parents because they'll say, "Well, you know, I really don't believe in therapy. Mm -hmm. I really don't believe in going to talk to anyone." And I always say, or I went and I really didn't like them. I'm like, okay, it's just like when you go to a smorgasbord, board, you try a little something. Right. Okay, you know that's yeah. not gonna work. Or yeah. you, you go in the, out to buy a pair of shoes, you try on maybe five pair of shoes and come out with one. So it's the same way, the approach that you have to take when you're looking for a professional. Mm -hmm. That don't stop at the first one. That right. may not be the fit. Mm -hmm. That may not be the person who really the child is able, or the adult, or whomever is able to connect so with. So important. So you really have <laughs> yes. to just, try more than one don't right. give up right. that can't be it. it's just like saying oh i like ice cream but i only like chocolate so i don't ever and if i can't have chocolate then i won't try something else you got to try yeah. you might like you might like vanilla you might like strawberry you know but you never yeah. know you know you just have to try i know yeah. those are simple analogies but no, i really but, think yeah. that it's important to get that variety understand yes, I, I think that's very good in someone who likes only chocolate ice cream <laughs> <laughs> You'll also find that most therapists it's out there are willing to refer yes, yes, <laughs> you know, and open point. to yes. referring. Yes. Most of us have networks that right, we refer exactly. to. Right. And so yeah. if, if I'm not working for you, that I, I know someone Cheryl else, or right. Kathy, yeah. or right. somebody does, yeah. That, yeah. That I know someone out there who mm -hmm. will be able to, we'll to yeah. work with us. Well, look at the network at the table. Yeah. Exactly. Just, you know, yeah. Right here. Now, I want to get on a very serious subject that, that has been of concern of, of mine in that first mental health in any person in a family affects the whole family. Absolutely. Uh, it it's, it's not just 
that one person isolated because we're there you have a family unit mm -hmm. and it affects your your family it affects your work mm -hmm. it affects everything else like this mm -hmm. so there's this rippling effect right. out mm -hmm. there then there is the maybe the feeling of isolation or the feeling of depression or I'm causing my family problems or I can't get along with anybody at school or work is just pure hell I can't mm -hmm. cope or right. things like this mm -hmm. and what is scaring me uh, in the emergency management hat that that I wear here at the county is that we are seeing suicide rates just almost skyrocket they are the highest they have been in the United States in 30 years now there's explanations for some of this the the economic downturn the recession that we had certainly affected a lot of people mm -hmm. a lot of people lost mm -hmm. everything mm -hmm. right. a lot of people had no jobs they d did not feel like that they had any kind of a future and they weren't going to share this with anyone and they just felt like that this was the way to in the turmoil and make things better for their family or something like that but in my research i also noticed that the suicide rate among early teen girls ages 10 to 14 the rate has tripled the suicide is a result of a mental condition on that what are the warning signs they vary yeah I would say it could be anything from isolation mm -hmm. um, just changing the, the routine uh, the activities that someone's involved in not really being interested in it any longer uh, again the sleeping you know not being able to sleep staying up for hours and hours uh, days and days uh, maybe even um, using some type of substance um, just feeling uh, hopeless mm -hmm. you know not really feeling as if life is worth living anymore and that might be you know just even in terms of you see someone all of a sudden they loved they loved uh, let's say a bracelet and now all of a sudden they're saying you know what you can have my bracelet you know just start giving away things that are really significant to them mm -hmm. Um, that because they feel like they're not going to be around any longer so that somebody else can enjoy whatever it is that they had. You know, it really is very difficult to kind of say that there's any one thing because it's such a combination of things. And again, it's, it's so important to be observant. You know, to, when you see someone doing something that's totally unusual, oh, okay. you know, just something that is not really who they are, um, then, you know, we need to again have those kind of conversations and not yeah. be afraid to have the conversations because that again is a major issue and you don't want to touch on it because if I say suicide they're going to commit suicide and that's that's, that's not not true, not yeah. true. I think true. that's what we have to we have to have those hard discussions so there's your stigma again yes. right exactly right, right. it yeah. drops up and you know you talk about teens but there are two populations on both ends that are um, suicide rates are very high and it's the teens and our older adults right mm -hmm. and some of the things in teens if they're preoccupied with death especially in this uh, age of social media you know with our teenagers we've got to watch what they're saying you know yeah. if they're consistently talking about I want to die or you know you see them posting things about death it might be nothing but we never want to take it for granted we want to pay attention to those mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. this person too preoccupied you know are they gifting you know mm -hmm. giving away things that are significant mm -hmm. are they doing things that are out of character you know the irritability you know that's a big you know red flag like we would say we have to mm -hmm. pay attention um, to that in teens um, deep depression yeah. You mm -hmm. know, uh, and that's the reason we want to talk about mental illness because if it's not controlled, if it's not paid attention to, it can end in death, it can end in suicide. And like Kathy says, we have to talk about it. You know, back in the day, we used to say, Do you want to harm yourself? Well, yeah, I might want to harm myself, but I don't want to kill myself. So it is okay to say, Do you want to kill yourself? And no, they're not going to go kill themselves right. because you ask because them. Because you suggested right. it. Right. Yeah. So you're giving them yeah. an out. Right. Yeah. Because yeah. most times they just want to help. 
yeah. to help yeah. and, and they discuss. Just want help. Yeah. Are you feeling safe towards yourself? Yes. Are, you know, are you having thoughts of hurting yourself or ending your life? Mm -hmm. Those, mm -hmm. those sorts of point blank direct. questions, very yes. direct, very direct. Um, can be lifesavers mm -hmm. at at the right time. When we're when we're in any of these situations where we've talked about suicide, mm -hmm. de the depression, the mm -hmm. ADHD, and things like this. Other than just talking, mm -hmm. uh, I know that there are uh, medicines yes. out there yes. that can, because, uh, help me with this, and I know y'all are not uh, physicians, right. but, and we don't need to get too clinical, but there are medications that will, because all of this affects your body chemistry, right. uh, is mm -hmm. what I've learned, and there are medications Yes, yeah, so that help. what I tell um, people uh, that medicines available to help and if you go to the doctor and the doctor suggests a medicine to take then if you don't you have the right not to take it but if you don't take it then you're gonna have the same problem but basically what the medicine does and this is layman terms is just stabilize the brain chemicals yeah. so that the individual can think appropriately because remember I said a mental illness affects the way you think right and mm -hmm. that medicine will stabilize the mood stabilize the thought process, stabilize the chemicals so that um, the individual can function appropriately. And I'm not going to go into this medicine is good for this, this medicine yeah. is good for that, because you ha everybody's got to have the right fit. You've got to write the, wear the right size shirt. Yes. You know, yeah. to, so that's yeah. the way. Yeah, there's and many I'll, different options. Yeah, and I'd also like to just add that sometimes it's really even not about medication. It's really about like your lifestyle. Yes. You know, you have to look at what are you putting in your body you know, uh, the foods that you eat, the chemicals that are you consuming, the environment, you know, it's so, it's so many different things that, yes, medication is, has, has tremendous uh, great uh, results, but I think also we have to look at what we're eating, you know, the foods that we're eating, and exercise. I mean, I really come from much more of a holistic perspective. I really do think yeah. that people are very much into being able to kind of understand the body and what we need to be putting in our body. So there's, you know, many ways to be able to, um, to just feel better, you know, and maybe it might be just taking a walk. Maybe right. it might be, okay, I'm going to start an exercise program. Because again, as we talked about the brain and the chemicals, mm -hmm. all those things are in our bodies already. Right. We just have to, and if we do certain things, it releases those same kind of uh, chemicals that some of the um, pharmaceuticals do as well. Your point, the brain mm -hmm. is an organ. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. You take medication for hypertension, high blood pressure. You right. take medicine for acid reflux, right. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so therefore you can take medication for to Manage. help your brain mm -hmm. stabilize yourself. The brain uses mm -hmm. the same yourself. blood, the same oxygen, yeah, the right. same nutrients as the whole rest of the body. That's, yeah. that's, mm -hmm. that's the point I was mm -hmm. trying to yeah. catch you mm -hmm. on that. So again, that word, shame, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'm embarrassed that I have to take this medicine. Mm -hmm. Who knows what kind of medicine you take? Right, right. You know, you, you take high blood pressure medicine. I don't know hardly anybody that's not on high blood pressure medicine. Right. <laughs> it's, that's the lack of sleep. That's, that's the lack of sleep. Yes. Yeah. And, yeah. and, right? and doing sleep. that, that's your anxiety, uh -huh. that's your everything else that's going on in, mm -hmm. in, in uh, you know, your, your body and all. Basically, the message that I want to, to highlight here is that there is help. There is. Absolutely. Yeah. There is. Um, counseling. Mm -hmm. um, and we didn't hit on family counseling. Let's talk oh. about family counseling for this moment. <laughs> because why. we talked about individual <laughs> yeah. and, and parents bringing in adolescents and teens and things like this. Uh, we didn't talk about adults who are having their own problems and right. trying to do that. but. That may be another subject for yeah. another day. But, but let's talk about family counseling yeah. for a moment because we did talk about the ripple effect mm -hmm. of, of what's going on. Well, family counseling, that's one of my areas of specialty. And I really uh, feel very strongly that it is a family issue. Yeah. It's not just the person who's, who's 
experiencing the difficulty and the challenges of maintaining their life. And once the family realizes that all of them are part of the wellness of that person, because it's the wellness of the entire family system, and it's the messages that the family has shared with this person that increases the wellness and decreases the shame and has much more of a positive impact, not only with the immediate, like the nucleus family, but also the, the community as a family. So they're seeing the, you know, the children or themselves, they're seeing themselves being able to function you know, in a much more healthy and, and a stable way because they have that family support. We can't walk in this world alone, whether we have a mental health, else, a mental health illness or if we have hypertension, diabetes, we need to be able to have support from each other, from our neighbors, from the churches, from schools. You know, it's a whole system that we live yeah. in. We don't live in just one little thing, mm -hmm. you know, one little compartment of our lives. It's everything. So I really encourage families to rally around um, providing that support for the person who may be presenting, but also that person's behavior and their wellness impacts everyone in that yes. family. Yeah. So that the children are suffering when the parents are suffering. Mm -hmm. we say, and the parents are suffering and when the children are yeah. yeah. suffering. And, and vice versa. Right. Like that. Yeah. We say problems don't happen in a bubble. Right. <laughs> you know, exactly. Right. Something that's affecting the child is affecting the grown up. Something right. that's affecting the, uh, mm -hmm. the grown up parents right. is affecting the, the child, is affecting their parents. Mm -hmm. um, the problems within the system of the family, if only one person seems to be experiencing them, you can be pretty sure that almost everyone is affected by them in some ways. Absolutely. Well, Cheryl uh, said early on in our discussion here today that all of us have a little bit of a mental health oh, yeah. issue. Absolutely. Of, of yeah. Some, we're it's, we're, we're all, <laughs> <laughs> yes we are, um, but you're correct, we don't live in a bubble mm -hmm. and that even though you may be a single person living by yourself, you are still affecting uh, other people with whom you yep. interact right. Community. all the time because right. it does go, okay, so let's talk about resources. Mm -hmm. uh, we're here in Douglas County and uh, are there resources? I know they are, but what are, what are the resources that we have locally that um, where people can get more information, where people can reach out? We have um, several, I mean, Douglas County I don't know the stats, but there are a lot of therapists mm -hmm. in yeah. Douglas County, mm -hmm. you know, and um, I, I want to go to the affordability of it because a lot of people also stay away from getting help because they don't have the resources. Now, um, we have the Community Service Board, yes. you know, to that, uh, their system is changing, but the, there there is um, help there, and if they can, there's resources there. We've got psychiatrists. Um, those are the ones that prescribe the yes. medicine and then you've got the psychologists those are the ones who do the testings and the evaluations mm -hmm. like if I might screen me I was gonna say you Wes but I might That's screen okay. me <laughs> I understand. ADHD, mm -hmm. but then I might send the individual to a psychologist to do the testing mm -hmm. and then once the testing is done that psychologist is going to send that child to the psychiatrist for medication. Okay. We've got NAMI, South Cobb, and NAMI Carrollton, because we're in the middle, mm -hmm. um, that we can refer to. We've got uh, GCAL, Crisis Line, and once we call that crisis line, no matter where you are in the country, they will find appropriate resources where you are in your zip code. Mm -hmm. to um, mm -hmm. offer to you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Some people like to use insurance to pay for their services, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so to pay for counseling. Um, and very often, if you want to go that route, uh, you can just call your insurance company and they can direct you to the provider who they're going to pay the most of a percentage to see. Very often it's all covered. Yeah. Um, and, then and they're not going to judge you. It's an insurance company. Right. Yes. Right. Yeah. Right. Uh, it's yeah. a yes. service that you that you have under your health insurance. For I, people who don't want to, to use, or rather for people who don't want to uh, receive the, the diagnostic label that mm -hmm. can come with using insurance, 
Um, some people like to do self-pay, and that's an option too, right. where basically no one ever has to know what diagnosis was put on, including you know an insurance company because yes. they're using self-pay. Or that you were even at a therapist right. Right. perpetuating yeah. the shame. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That's why I the stigma and the shame. Well, I think the other thing too is that people may not even know that their employers Oh, provide oh, EAP. EAP. EAP, assistance uh, programs. Mm -hmm. What does for, that do, Kathy? That provides the employee the opportunity to use that. They may have insurance, but they also have another benefit, the employee assistance program. And that employee assistance program will be able to give them a number of visits that cost them absolutely nothing, and not only for them, but also for their families. So that's another way for them to be able to have a sense of confidentiality and no money out of their pocket, and to be able to get the help that they need for themselves or for their family. Yeah. Okay. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so very much for coming in and for all of this information. Um, and now I want to talk to the viewers just for a moment. If you find yourself having a hard time coping with life, reach out and get some help. At the end of our show, we're going to scroll a number of phone numbers and websites that where you can go and, and get help. If you are thinking um, anything close to suicide, please reach out to someone. Uh, please call 1-800-999-9999. It's a national suicide help hotline call them, they will help you, they will talk to you, they will send you to local thing. Your life is worth saving. Yes. Please don't think that that is the solution. It's, it's, it's not. There is help. If you think that you're desperate, if you think things are bad, there's help. And that's why we're doing this show. We hope very much that you will get, um, you'll reach out, you'll speak up. There is no shame in asking for help. And we hope that this show has brought some focus into this subject for you. I'm Wes Talon. Thanks for joining us.